Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar. We are going to discuss the links that exist between road safety and other important areas of public policy, uh, which are inclusion, equity, gender, and sustainability. You can uh, follow the discussion today in English, in Spanish, or in Portuguese. Simply make your choice um, in the Zoom control bar and set your preferred language. My name is Alexandre Santa Cruz, and I work at the International Transport Forum as a policy analyst. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, this webinar is part of the Safer City Streets initiative that um, is delivered by the ITF and funded by the FIA. So what is Safer City Streets? Uh, it is a network of cities to share their experience and their data uh, to support better road safety policies. 48 cities take part in the network, with some of them, such as Mexico City and Fortaleza, on the panel today. Uh, a new report is in preparation, uh, a global gathering also. I will tell you more um, about that, about the next steps uh, in just a moment at the end of the webinar. But now I would like to introduce the chair of this workshop, Stephen Perkins, who is head of research and policy analysis here at the ITF. Steve will take us through two panel sessions and will stimulate uh, a conversation, which I hope you will contribute to through the chat and the Q&A. So over to you, Steve, thank you. Thank you, Alex, and welcome to our Safer City Streets Initiative webinar on safety, equity, and sustainability. And first, the key thing for me to say as moderator is please do participate through the question and answer button and through the chat. We're gonna have two sessions of three presentations each, as you see on the slide, and each will be followed by discussion uh, between the panelists in response to the questions that you put through on the Q&A. Um, now, the context for the webinar is the beginning of the second decade of action uh, for UN road safety, which puts a very big emphasis on integrating all of the UN sustainable development goals. And today we'll explore the linkages between safety, inclusion, equity, gender and sustainability. And we'll do that with our partners in Dispatcho, in WRI and Walk 21, and showcase interventions that are making practical impacts on the ground in three of the cities in the network of safer city streets, where in cities where the social and gender equity agendas are very much the first priority of the city administrations. And I think the underlying philosophy is that if you can make streets safe for the people with the most difficult daily trips, and that's people on low incomes, typically in peripheral areas with long commutes, dependent on walking and public transport, and this is very often women, with children, they typically have the worst conditions of all. If you can improve their journey, then you'll make mobility safer for all, and you'll make sustainable modes much more viable and competitive across the city. So we'll begin with Fernanda Rivera. She's the Director General for Road Safety and for Active Urban Mobility Systems, and also for parking in Mexico City. Uh, where the administration has been driving a marked acceleration of interventions to create safe environments for safe mobility. And she'll be followed by Natalia Yeras, uh, lead of Healthy Cities at Dispacho in Colombia. And she'll be talking us through her work on cycling and youth and gender equity. And then Claudia Adriazola, who's the Director for Urban Mobility for Health and for Road Safety at uh, the WRI Ross Center for Sustainable Cities. Uh, I will draw out the conclusions of how to get these kind of policies high on every city's agenda. So without taking any more time, I'd like to hand the floor over to you, uh, Fernanda. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everyone. I'm really happy to be sharing with you Mexico City experience. I will be speaking about gender, how we need to consider women and girls travels every day on a daily basis so we can incorporate the road safety vision on this. So I'm really happy to be today with you. I'm sharing my screen right now. And well, I'm gonna make it in English. If I have any problem with it, I'll change to Spanish, but I think I can make it in English right now. 
I'm really happy to have this transversal vision of broad safety because whenever we speak about our saving lives agenda, we need to realize that we're speaking about different uh, contexts, different people, different patterns of travels. And in this case, speaking about women and girls is a uh, daily basis thing that should be happening. Just a little bit of context, Mexico City is a metropolitan area. We have 19 million trips every day, 8 million trips, 8 million people live exactly just in Mexico City, but 20 million people live in the whole metropolitan area. Something that is good about Mexico City that I think that a lot of Latin American cities share is that seven out of 10 trips are made by walking, cycling, or public transit. Only three out of 10 trips are made by car or motorcycles. And this is something that is important because this also shows the inequities that we have in our cities, no, in our local context. We know that there's inequality on mobility, not only inequality when we speak about uh, the income, no? how the central zone is connected with a lot of buses, all the public transit, all the cycle lanes. And whenever we see outside the central area, the peripheric areas are the ones that spend the most time on their travel and also the higher quantity of their income. And whenever we check out the gender uh, analysis of what's going on, the women pattern travels are not usually attended, no? We leave women that are the ones that walk the most and that use most of the public transit unattended, usually in the non-peak hours. I'm gonna show you the specific data of women's mobility patterns in Mexico City. I think that this is really important for us to see the gender gap, to realize how women and men are moving differently in our cities, and this is exactly in Mexico City. Something that is really important is that when you see the total trips that are care related or mobility of care, that are all these trips are usually related to taking care of kids, of elder people, all these trips that are related to something um, that is focused on the gender roles that have been assigned to women. We see the big gap, no? The number of trips that are made by women is almost six times higher than in the case of men that are doing mobility of care. In the case of work-related trips, more women are making, more men are making work-related trips rather than women, also for a study. And in the case of spare other purposes or chores, more women are making this type of trips because that's the type of mobility that women have. No, in the case of men, they're usually A to B point in the peak hours, they're the commuting related trips. And in the case of women, we have poly purposes trips that are usually short trips and in non-peak hours. This is also the hours that women and men travel. This is amazingly to see, no? Women travel the most in the non-peak hours. And these non-peak hours are the ones that are not usually attended by a higher number of buses or a higher number of units that can attend these trips that are usually made by women. The orange line is the one that is representing the women trips. And also when we see the, the mode of transport we're using, women walk the most in Mexico City, no? The people that are using the streets that are walking every day, there are usually more women than men. And in the case of having a car, less women have a car and more men have a car. And also women occupy more the taxi uh, public transit, no? That's, I think this is really important because we realize that whenever we're speaking about sustainable mobility, active mobility, and pedestrian mobility, we're speaking about women and girls because they're the ones that walk the most in Mexico City. Also, we made this analysis. We disaggregated the data between women and men and what's going on when we're speaking about road safety. And it's impressive what we saw in the case of Mexico City. In the case of injuries, we realized that three out of 10 injuries are, include women. And also in the case of fatalities, two out of 10 include women. This sounds something that it's normal in these cities because we know that men are more involved in these accidents. But when we analyze what's going on specifically for their age and for the type of vehicle, we discover in the case of women 
that more girls and more elder women are dying on the streets. No, they're having these fatalities and they're related to their age. And we know that more women and more elderly women are the ones that are walking the most. And also when we analyze a type of vehicle, we realize that the women that walk and the passengers that are driving on a motorcycle or on the buses, they are the ones that are having the higher number of fatalities compared to men. This is also related to that type of pattern of mobility that women have in Mexico City. That's why we need to realize that we need to invest in better sidewalks, in better crosswalks, to improve the whole infrastructure of walking. And this would be really inclusive for all women. And if it's inclusive for girls and women, it's gonna be safer for everyone on the streets. That's why I'm gonna show you a program that we just implemented in Mexico City, that it's a road safety with a gender uh, vision of the policy. So what we have to do, we have to improve our pedestrian mobility. If we have safer infrastructure, if we promote this rec reconfiguration of our cities, we're gonna have better spaces for women, better spaces for kids and better, better and safer spaces for everyone. We have a program that is called Walk Free, Walk Safe. This is a gender policy that is uh, promoted by our women department and they are focusing on women's safety. It, it's all according to public space safety, but they're including some improvements in the infrastructure for making not only safer for public security of women, how we feel when we're walking by night, when we have a little light, and when we feel unsafe riding and walking on the streets. And this also includes the improval of the infrastructure that it's on the streets. In this case, we paint the crosswalks, we improve the intersections, we give ac uh, universal accessibility for everyone. We increase the number of lights and we know that light has also an impact in road safety because it makes a better condition of the environment and how women walk. And also, of course, you, well, we have a lot of women right here connected as panelists. And we know that the perception of unsafe spaces on the street is higher by women. No, I think that in the case of Mexico City, nine out of 10 women, we have perceived unsafe spaces on the street. And that's why we need to improve them. Also, there is a whole reconfiguration of the car lanes of the space that we need to cross across the, the street. And this just is not only safe for reducing the gender related crimes, we have a 23% reduction, but it also has an impact in the reduction of saving lives on the streets. And we have this gender vision for this program. We have these pedestrian crosswalks that is a complete improvement. We have intervened 117 crosswalks in Mexico City and the program Walk Free, Walk Safe has intervened 222 kilometers of streets in Mexico City with all these uh, gender vision. In the case of the crosswalks, we have seen a reduction of 32% of deaths where we have intervened and changed the, well, the infrastructure for pedestrians in, the, in Mexico City. So we know this works. We know that whenever you invest on um, having safer infrastructure and you have this vision of having women and girls safer, you're gonna improve and you're gonna have this type of vision, no? lower traffic streets where we have an improvement of public space and that girls can go and enjoy the public space safely and that they can also have this freedom of walking on the streets or riding a bicycle in Mexico City. These are interventions that were made last year. It's a whole reconfiguration of the streets because we want to have a slower roads in these local uh, streets in Mexico City. Also, Having a redesign of our streets, these pedestrian uh, crosswalks that we used to have before, we change them to a level of the street uh, crosswalk. And this is important because as a woman, having to walk in these spaces that are overpasses for pedestrians that are unsafe, that are really close for you, they give you this vision of unsafety. And also you're winning to having a, a street level crosswalk that you don't have to go upside anything. And now the priorities for pedestrians and not for cars. So we have been taking off these pedestrian crosswalks of, that are overpasses in the last two years. I think that there have been like 10 of them 
being taken off and having these interventions at street level. So it's also, it's not only a road safety vision, it's a gender vision to have safer spaces for everyone. In Mexico City, we have a, a gender gap in the case of cycling. It's only 22% of the total cyclist trips are made by women and 78% are made by men. We made an analysis and a, a, a interview with a lot of women that are cyclists, are non-cyclists, to realize what is the strategy that will improve having more women riding a bicycle in the cities. And the answer of all the women that were interviewed was having safe infrastructure. We want cycle paths, we want cycle lanes. This is the map of how we have increased the network of cycling infrastructure in Mexico City in the last two years. We passed from having 251 kilometers to 432 kilometers in the city. Now we're kind of seeing a network in the cycle lanes in Mexico City. And we're really happy about that because it let us have this uh, essence, no? people and women riding safely on the cities. And we want to increase the number of women riding. One of our goals is to duplicate the number of women riding a bicycle in Mexico City in the next years. And that's really important for us because when we have safer streets, we're going to have all these mobility of care trips, maybe taken by bicycle, no, and having more kids riding and feeling safer on the streets and enjoying the Mexico City's the cycling facilities that we're building today. This is Insurgentes, a Stephen that has been in Mexico City a lot of times. Insurgentes is the largest avenue, I think the third largest avenue in the world and the largest avenue in Mexico City. And we're gonna build a 40 kilometer cycle lane permanent that is started like a pop-up bike lane on the COVID emergency. And now we're gonna build it permanently. And we have a BRT, two car lanes, uh, an amazing new cycle lane and uh, amazing sidewalks. And we're gonna have a great complete street in one of the largest uh, streets in Mexico City. And also we have our open street program and bike school. We have realized in the last years that adult women, more or less 45, 60 years old, they never learned how to ride a bicycle because it was considered an activity for men. So when we see the gender gap in our bike schools, we know that in the case of girls and boys, we have no more gender gap. 50% are girls and 50% are boys that go to, to our bike schools. But in the case of adult women and men, 75% of the people that attend the bike schools to learn how to ride a bike are women and only 20%, 25% are men. That's why we have our free bike schools that have a gender vision so we can give the tools for all the women that want to ride a bicycle in Mexico City. And we know that our open street program is one of the best ways for women to get confidence of riding a bicycle in a street that is, well, they say that it's closed for cars, but we say that it's open for people and that they can enjoy this public space and realize the, the distances on the bicycle that enjoying your city by bike, it's easier as they thought. So this is, I think, one of the most important programs that we have to promote a way of using a bicycle that it's also, well, that it's also very useful with the permanent cycle lanes that we have in Mexico City. And last but not least, we need to improve public transit. We need to promote massive transit that part of our comprehensive strategy of mobility in every city. We have also been investing in the lower income areas with high quality transport in Mexico City. This is our new cable car. This is our new electric buses for our BRT, our new trolleys. And I think that having quality mobility in public transit is one of the best strategies to have sustainable trips, more inclusive trips that include people from the most um, lower income zones in Mexico City at least. And also, of course, it's the best way to reduce the use of car in Mexico City because we want more people that continue using the public transit, that continue walking, that continue riding a bicycle because they feel safe and they feel safe of choosing this option as the principal mode of transport and mobility in Mexico City. 
So thank you very much. I hope this shares the vision of how improving the safety of women and girls has also a role in our road safety strategies in the whole world. And thank you for giving me a space to share Mexico City experience today. Thank you, Fernanda. That was uh, excellent. And you've got uh, some very nice comments coming through in the chat. Um, keep questions coming in. Uh, we'll hold them until the discussion. Um, and we'll go straight to Claudia in uh, Bogota and you'll pick up the story, I think, uh, very closely with what you're doing uh, with cycling there. So over to you. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. It's a pleasure to be here and show you a little bit about the project that we have in Colombia. Um, so our project is called Vivo Mi Calle. Um, our project is founded by Foundation Botnar and is part of the Healthy um, Cities for Adolescents program. Um, the, uh, the main objective is to improve the health of adolescents through their participation in the creation and of routes and um, public spaces that foster their rights to he healthy cities. And when we talk about healthy cities, you know, I want to go back a little bit and explain a little bit what is health. So health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. And this is what we're trying to do uh, with urban planning in our cities. So we all know the benefits of cycling. We know that it, um, it increases uh, your physical activity. It can protect you from um, some diseases like um, heart, disease, heart disease or stroke. It can also um, improve um, your social activity, increase it. It can reduce stress level, depression levels, and it can um, increase your uh, mental like health or state. Um, but there's also many reasons why people don't bike. And so we work with the youth in understanding the reasons why they don't or the, the, everything that limits their mobility or their access to certain areas. So they tell us, you know, there's there's about 30 indicators, risk indicators that we have um, addressed with them, and they can be grouped into road safety, personal safety, uh, sexual harassment, and any other environmental risks. And when we talk about environmental risks, we also talk about um, invisible borders. We talk about um, smells or, or a lot of garbage, anything that um, basically modifies um, your um, travel. And so what we want to do is also by also, I mean, by promoting the bicycle, we're improving health, but we also want to address this risk to improve health. Um, and so when we address this risk, when we uh, reduce the risks that they face when they uh, use the bicycle, we are guaranteeing the integrity of the cyclist, we are reducing stress, and we are also promoting the access to the city. So we will have more people biking. <clears throat> and this is the project I wanted to, to share with you. It's called uh, the Healthy Route in Palmira. We've been working together with the mayor's office in Palmira and also the World Resources Institute in this bike path. We started working in September. So it's been uh, a little over two months uh, that we have been working on this project. And just to give you an idea, Palmira is a small municipality in Colombia, uh, close to Cali, about 20, 27 kilometers from Cali. It has more than 3,000, uh, 350,000 inhabitants, and it also has a big um, bicycle history. The model share in this city is about almost, it's almost 12%, which is really high if we compare, for example, to Bogota, where we have a seven to six, uh, a six to 7% of bicycle share. Here is very high, almost 12%. But the issue that we have is that only 20% of women are actually uh, part, of, part of that model share. Um, so this is what we found. As you can see, there's bikes everywhere. It's a beautiful city. And um, so what we wanted to do with this project is to involve the youth in the creation of the route and also to improve health, not only as in, as in mental, physical, and social uh, well-being, but also promote sustainability, physical activity, um, safety, and have a gender approach. Um, so to include the youth, we did a, a bunch of uh, digital map-based uh, surveys, about 1,700. 
And we asked the youth, what are those locations um, in the surrounding area of, uh, that we were studying, uh, the attractive locations to them. So we found a really good uh, amount of people that were interested in the, in the stadium area. Um, and also there's a big park, like a water park that they're interested in. So we um, began to, to like, let's say, walk around this route, like walk in this route and see what are the issues that they're facing um, every day on the bicycle. And um, we decided to do two phases of the project. So I will talk about the, the first phase that was just recently, that is actually gonna be inaugurated tomorrow. So we decided to connect the one of uh, a park of the witches. This is, this is what it's called the stadium and the local university. That's our first stretch. So we took in the, the needs of the, of the youth to kind of prioritize where the infrastructure was gonna be. And we also make sure that this is not just one stretch that is independent from the network, but we make sure that there, you know, the, this uh, route is connecting to different, um, to the actual, the cycling network of the city. So in terms of road safety, uh, we measure speeds. Uh, we saw the speed limit is 30 kilometers per hour, but actually cars are going even to almost 70 kilometers per hour. So we have a speed problem. Um, we took a look at land use, the loading areas that they had, the, the lane of the, um, the width of the lanes, the width of the roads, what type of cyclists do we have on the road and what type of um, vehicles we have in the, in the road. And as you can see here, um, on the right, we have a big share of bicycles is almost 8%. And we also have a big, big share of uh, motorcycles. So what uh, we wanted to do also with the mayor is um, try to improve the infrastructure so we can get we can get a lot of people to shift from the motorcycle to the, to the bicycle. Um, so this is just to show you uh, what the design looks like. Uh, this is part of, of the stretch. Here we have the stadium and it's um, segregated infrastructure in both uh, directions. And also talk about a little bit of uh, personal safety. Uh, when we did the service, we asked the, the youth and the community, what are the reasons that they have not to ride a bike? And they said, for example, that it's very dark at night. So we did a lighting audit and we walked around the route and we found that, for example, we have big trees that are blocking the light. The, the lighting is not necessarily bad, but you know, there's uh, some lamps that are damaged and then sort of some trees that are blocking the light. So we are working with the city to improve that. Um, and to talk about a gender approach, uh, we're using segregated infrastructure in the whole stretch. We know that when we have uh, segregated infrastructure, we, um, we can increase the amount of women that use uh, the, the bicycle. So that was one, uh, the, one of the things that we kept in mind to improve um, or to increase the number of women that use the corridor. Uh, and we're also doing a street uh, harassment awareness campaign. Um, as you can see here in the graph, we also asked the girls if this is one of the reasons why they don't ride a bike. And many of them says, uh, the, the purple line is actually women. That is uh, a reason, uh, one of uh, the big reasons why they don't ride a bike. So we are go going to also do um, a street harassment campaign in the corridor to stop, and that's also violence against women. So we are trying to raise awareness on that. And to include also the youth in the uh, implementation of the route, we did um, a participatory urbanism sessions where the youth came to paint um, some of the murals that we thought of uh, for the route. You can see the pictures here. And well, this is actually uh, about a, like a few days ago, uh, we were working uh, on the route and we already have women using the route as is you know, segregated. The idea, we will also have a segregation on the other side, but so far we have one side. And of course, the segregation is going to be yellow. We just had to protect the, of course, the murals. And this is what the bike path is, is looking like now. We hopefully, I will share pictures with you of what, you know, the, 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 final, the final design. 
So that's the project. Thank you. Natalia, thank you very much. And sorry for calling you Claudia at the beginning. So now that's over fine. to the actual Claudia, and you can take up the story and take us on to uh, how we get these uh, kind of initiatives on the front of the radar of every city municip uh, government. Claudia. Thank you very much, Steve. And uh, congratulations to Fernanda and Natalia. It's really heartwarming to see all the changes that are happening uh, so fast, I would say. All right, let's get started. And uh, I just want to share with you from the WRI side, the World Resources Institute, what concerns us. Uh, climate change. The transport sector is responsible for 24% of the global GHG emissions. And we also know that cities produce 70% of the carbon emissions around the world. So there is a lot of work that it needs to be done. Now let's tie that agenda with uh, the road safety agenda. And I want to point out to two facts in this um, statistic that comes from WHO. The number one is about um, kids, young people, the first cause of death for children five to 14 and young people 15 to 29 are traffic crashes. Let's just think about the inequality of that. Um, and also the 54% of vulnerable users of the road are the ones that are killed. Uh, so we are talking about pedestrians, cyclists, the ones that have the least resources. Now we know that as countries uh, increase their economic um, development, they also tend to decrease the activity, uh, the physical activity. And we see here in China, in just 18 years, physical activity was reduced by 45%. It is a critical issue so much that this generation of kids will have a shorter life expectancy than their parents. This is the first in a hundred years and is due to how we are building the cities where we live. We are of course scared to send in our children to play outside. On top of that, we are breathing really bad air. 92% of the people around the world breathe bad air. Um, and COVID-19 has really put a lot of pressure on mental health. As you can see, this is a study uh, that has been done in the UK, where you can see a difference already from 2017 to 2020 in boys and girls in different age brackets where, he, where mental illness is growing. We have had to put the kids in lockdown, not going to schools, and we know that children need physical activity. It's very important for them. This is a case um, in Lima. We are working with the city of Lima to see how we create a school, safe school zones in downtown Lima. And one statistic that really um, was interesting and hard to see is that the most children that die in this area in downtown Lima died during vacation because there is no space for them to play. They live in very small uh, apartments um, and they have to play on the streets and they get hit and they get killed here. So just to think about the pressure that humans are enduring in terms of public health, transport and COVID, let's look at some numbers. The annual debt uh, for uh, traffic crashes is a million three hundred and fifty thousand. The annual debts due to poor air quality is increasing every year. It's at seven million right now. People that die prematurely because of poor air quality. In terms of physical inactivity, we have around three point two million people. So all of that every year adds up to eleven million, 11,550,000 people that die every year silently. And if we compare this to COVID-19 that has really forced us to change our lives, we can see that in the first year of COVID-19, we had around a million and 300,000 people that died. 
And in the two years that we are uh, facing this pandemic, it's about 5 million and 150,000 uh, people. So you can see the stark difference in how we have reacted to a public health threat, uh, but silently we are facing other ones. All right. In terms of gender, I think Fernanda has done a brilliant presentation, and this is just in a border to just say that it's exactly the same. Women tend to work more, tend to uh, make shorter trips, and they are the ones that are the most represented in traffic crashes as pedestrians. So having a policy, a gender policy that counts and doesn't neglect women, as Mexico is doing right now, is absolutely critical. If we want to achieve the sustainable development goals, and this is something absolutely important from the new decade of action, um, we really need to focus on road safety. And you can see that the sustainable goals one, four, five related to women, eight, 10, that are totally connected to road safety. We need to have safer transport access for women. If we want um, you know, education or lowering poverty, we cannot have the first cause of death for children to be road safety. In terms of uh, goal number three, of course, this is totally related to public health 11. We need more inclusive cities. We need protection for vulnerable users of the road in 13 climate change. So the main issue of road safety during all these years has been to put it in a silo and to think that road safety equals to a band-aid. Uh, what does that mean? It's just going to one intersection and trying to change that intersection because it's problematic or that road here or that uh, corner there. It is not like that. If we have 1,350,000 people, it's because this is a structural problem that is also touching and making countries, particularly the poor ones, even worse. So now let's talk about action in the um, three minutes that I have left. The problem really begins here in cities that have been planned and designed only to have cars. And that's why Fernanda was talking about uh, bridges, pedestrian bridges that are really car bridges because they allow for cars to keep their speed. So we really have to think a little bit more on how we are building our cities, how we are planning our cities. And if we want to reduce climate change, this cannot be the model that we need to follow. The model that we need to follow is really walking, cycling, and using mass transportation. So I propose this set of indicators because I think we really have to start measuring what we want to achieve. First of all, we need to put under control our CO2 uh, reductions and start thinking about net zero cities as COP26 has concluded recently. The model share. Fernanda and Natalia have uh, shared with us how Mexico City and uh, cities in Colombia have a really healthy model share. You can see that 85%, 90% of people walk, cycle, or use mass transportation. That is an ideal policy for climate change. But with one caveat, that it needs to be a choice and not something that because we don't have any other option, we have to risk our lives and work, risk our lives and buy, or be really uncomfortable as a woman in mass transportation. So quality and safety and security are crucial here. Say bike and pedestrian networks, we have to start thinking about where people want to go and they can go everywhere and anywhere in the city. Are we having networks or just one cycle lane here and there? We need to think about this in a more comprehensive way. Perception service, how our women, our children, our elderly are feeling when they use mass transportation, walking and cycling, and not only feeling, 
But what are the numbers? Are we continue killing them or are we really protecting them? Air quality, we should deeply react to that. We cannot live with that poor quality of air that really kills us silently. Accessibility is about equity and is a possibility for all of us to be able to access economic development. Physical activity, we can definitely count this and we should. And finally, children's mental health, which is absolutely critical after COVID-19. With that, I just want to thank you, um, Stephen, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Claudia. And we have a question uh, in the open questions from Leandro Perillo, um, exactly on the point where you left off. You've set out a nice uh, set of indicators that we need to be using to uh, determine progress and determine priorities. Leandro asks how, uh, in his case in, in Lima, how do we evaluate the environment in terms of safety and friendliness to uh, to different categories of users. Um, I'd like to ask you first, uh, Fernanda, how you go about that or do you go about doing that in Mexico City now? How, have you got a way of evaluating or some indicators you use for categorizing the, the environment for walking and particularly for women as safe, unsafe? How do you know you're making progress? Yes, we have an evaluation that it's uh, led by our Ministry of Women in Mexico City they made a survey and they realized where women feel felt unsafe, well, more unsafe in the city. And also they analyzed all the crime rate in every street. And according to the number of crime rate that was registered in these uh, walk-free uh, spaces, they made an analysis. And we shared also the data of road safety, how many accidents of women happened in these uh, spaces. And now they're making the evaluation after one year of implementation of some of these um, interventions. And they check another time the crime rate, how it has been reduced. And that's why we have a 23% reduction in the number of women having these uh, problems on the streets. I have to add something that I think is important. We put a, a panic button all around the intervention so women can feel safe that if you have any problem on the street that you're being harassed or anything that could happen, you can make uh, the, well, you can push the button and have the attention of the police. So we're, we're working like in a comprehensive strategy with the Ministry of Women, the Public Works Ministry and the Mobility Department with Road Safety Vision. Yeah, and there are other things you can, that have been done in other uh, cities as well, uh, Leandro. London does a very interesting exercise in measuring the accessibility of every location to public transport. It was initially an academic exercise to understand accessibility, particularly on foot and by public transport across the city. Now it's part of the planning regulations and you cannot build a high rise if you don't have a good public transport accessibility uh, indicator. So I think that's a big subject um, uh, with a lot of things that can be done, but uh, Claudia certainly highlighted the importance of doing that kind of thing. We have a, another question in uh, from, uh, from Per Weissenborn on the relationship between the very local levels of government and uh, the city government as a whole, and how you get, uh, at what political level um, do you get most interaction with the population who's really determining where the safety investments go and how the policy develops? Again, Fernanda, do you want to pick up on that? I know uh, Bronwyn is going to talk a bit about that in the next session as well. Um, but uh, Fernanda, in Mexico City, how does it work with the, the very level of administration? Well, we work, uh, we have the central government and the local governments. And we work with them because they're responsible of all the local streets. So we had to have this share uh, work to intervene the local streets and the Mexico City government intervene the bigger streets, not the ones that are the main streets in Mexico City. So we work a lot with them. And I think that in the last two years, 
road safety agenda has been more important in Mexico City's public space, no? And also in the public arena where we discuss. And now we have the congressmen interested in it, the local governments interested in it, the activists and the NGOs, and also Mexico City government that is the new area that was created this administration. So we are, th I think that we're, we're getting aware of the road safety agenda in Mexico City. And we're including this type of indicators in many different projects that are not specifically for road safety uh, design. Yeah, and we had a, wor a workshop last week uh, on as part of Safer City Streets, where in London, uh, the head of road safety for Transport for London, which is the municipal authority, really stressed the importance of the what they call boroughs in uh, London, which is the very small local administrations where the problems are and where the spending are often very low cost interventions, but they really are the ones that contribute to uh, road safety. Uh, and without that, um, the cities would struggle and even more so at the national level, uh, national governments depending on what cities achieve. Claudia, you had your hand up, so I guess you want to come in. Yeah, very quickly. Um, just to say that um, the World Bank, WRI, and the government of the Netherlands have just put out a series of papers on transport decarbonization investments. And we have one um, where Bronwyn, for example, participated very actively on active mobility, which is very much linked to road safety. So what we have found there is when the national government really prioritizes um, active mobility, it can be a big change. We saw, for example, in Peru, how the Ministry of Transportation put a part of money for COVID-19 actions, and 400 municipalities um, access those funds. In Ireland, right now, they have decided that 20% of their budget will go into active mobility, so walking and cycling, and that is around 370 million um, uh, euros every year. So it's really the national government that can make quite a bit of um, change. Thank you, yeah. And Natalia, I wanted to bring you in to a discussion that was uh, in the uh, Q&A a little bit earlier between, uh, launched by Blair Turner in the, in the World Bank and with uh, Fernando answering partly already, um, about lighting. Uh, which you also did covered in your presentation, and uh, the improvement of the environment for women in terms of reducing crime and harassment. Um, how much, uh, the question that was, uh, how much can you attribute the improvement in conditions to lighting itself, and how much to, to other men uh, measures to improve the safety and the, the feeling of safety of crossings and other part, critical parts of the, the system, like the pedestrian bridges? Yeah, I mean, in this case, um, what we did is base ourselves in the surveys that we did, the digital surveys, to understand the reasons why women don't bike in the city. Um, and they, they talked about dark, it was too dark, and also sexual harassment. So we are trying to address that, that right now. We don't have um, the after results because we are uh, launching officially the route tomorrow. This is uh, something that we're still working on but we still have a lot of data. Um, we gathered a lot of data on the use, current use of the corridor, so we can compare the before and after and see what's the increase of women that are using the corridor. Um, so we think these measures segregating, uh, lighting, and um, campaign against uh, street harassment can actually improve or uh, increase the number of women using the, the corridor. And Fernanda, did you want to say a little bit more about that from your data in Mexico? Yes, actually, uh, I think that the Ministry of Women, they have all these specific data of what's the impact of lighting, but it's impressive how lighting can change your experience on the street. And also we know that it has an impact in road safety, you know, because a lot of crashes and or runovers, they happen in darker spaces. So I think that lighting is not only for the experience of women to reduce harassment or reduce the unsafe perception of the streets, but it can also help us to have a better road safety and crosswalks. And I think that the Women Ministry has all these data recorded of all the interventions they have made. And we had um, comments coming from Emma saying how 
much better. She thought that the lighting that you were installing in uh, in Mexico City was than many cities in the uh, in the European Union, where uh, dark spots on crossings is a, has been recognised as a particular problem. Uh, in those slides you showed as well, it struck me that uh, you have maybe a much more conservative approach to road markings in terms of the crossings, just black and white, not very bright black or not very bright white, uh, contrasting with what we saw in Cali and what we'll see later in Fortaleza, where they're using a lot of bright colors to really draw up people's attention. Has that been a debate in Mexico City? Mostly things are very bright and colorful in Mexico, but your your crossings look pretty old fashioned apart from the very nice uh, multi-directional crossing that you showed, which is really a state of the art to get pedestrians on the shortest travel lines. Well, we use just the white painting that it's thermoplastic and it has these, uh, well, I'm gonna say it in Spanish because I don't know the exact name. It's like uh, esferas con... It's like spheres, they have spheres that help reflect the light. Uh, implemented in Mexico City, but... Okay, so maybe it looks better at night than in the daytime. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks very much. We may have time to come back to some of these points uh, later on, but I'd like now to uh, switch quickly to the second panel, and then we'll continue the discussions and bring everybody in uh, as far as we can. Uh, so we switched now to uh, three presentations from Bronwyn Thornton, uh, who's the CEO of the Walk 21 Foundation, and she'll discuss her experience in improving streets for safe and sustainable mobility, taking us to Europe to look at one smallish city is doing at the basic level, at the local, the very local level. Um, before we go back to Latin America with Paolo Tapia, who's, yeah. the, who's uh, the head of the infrastructure and transportation in Santiago's regional metropolitan government and was formerly uh, Minister of Transport for the country and Hannah Silva, who's an urban planner in the municipality of Fortaleza. Um, and she'll be talking about their principle that if you make streets safe for kids, they'll be safe for everyone. So over to you, Bronwyn. Great, thanks so much, uh, Stephen. And thank you for the invitation to uh, join today. I'm really pleased to share what is actually unusual for me now I'm having, here we go, here's my shut slide share. I'll bring up, is that clear? Can you see that? Great. Okay. So I'm going to, I want to talk about how we can utilize road safety to deliver on some of these broader agendas. And you've heard already from Claudia and from others around some of the bigger issues and some of the bigger benefits and, and factors to be considered when we, when we look at this. But I wanna start with a really super local example. And um, it's just not, it's not normally where I start, but this is my local high street. And, uh, and very often I spend a lot of time in global statistics, imperatives, inspiration, but I still am inspired by this incredibly local example from my um, high street which is a very popular street. It's a very busy local shopping street, but it's also an A road, which in the UK means it's a through road for traffic and it's owned by the local county council. So talking about layers, we have a national um, department for transport. We have a county council and we have a local uh, borough council. And then we have a parish council uh, for, this, uh, for this street as well. But the people who own the street and dominate the decision-making is the, um, the county council whose priority thinking, their policy frameworks is all about movement of, of traffic. And so on this local street, we have a lot of retailers and a lot of pedestrian movement. And a local campaign group has been looking to improve the public space and make it a nicer place um, for, for a number of years, getting small grants from the local authority to make uh, little improvements and wayfinding and things like that. But, um, and the traders, of course, retailers, believe that all their customers come um, by car. Now, this is the street from another perspective. I've been into Google Maps because you can go back in time um, with Google Street View and I can capture it before um, the interventions I'm going to, to talk about. And what's interesting here is that when we actually, they started doing a lot of work in my local town. And what we discovered in understanding a parking review was that 50% of customers to this local shopping street come by foot. 
even when you represent this information to retailers, they still deeply believe that they need all their customers to come by car and they need loads of on-street parking. And if you take away any vehicle traffic, you're going to destroy their business. But what we know is that if people walk out their front door they're more, and they're walking, they can walk to their local high street, they're more likely to go there. But if they can get in their car, they'll go further afield to, to other centres. So this need to support local, um, local shopping districts was, was part of the dynamic here. And in the midst of all these conversations and about what could we do and what could happen, Suddenly, the road safety engineers popped up and said, oh, by the way, we're putting in some road safety interventions and they're non-negotiable because it's road safety and we've got a warrant and here's the scheme. And it was such a sort of a shock to the local community because it was a traffic centred road safety intervention, even though it was there to improve life for pedestrians. And all they wanted to do was plop three uh, centre bollards, you know, centre islands for people to cross um, down this down this uh, this high street. Luckily, as a result of having a sort of an active local community and fair it to be to say me in the mix of that and interested in what was going on, we managed to negotiate this road safety intervention into improvements for public realm and accessibility in exactly the sort of subjects that we're talking today. And in this picture, which I'm not going to do with the animation, but you can see we have some curb build outs here in these circles. So instead of putting those islands in the middle of the road, the road safety necessity was to reduce the crossing distance so that people spend less time in the carriageway. By translating that into curb build outs, you've created more viable, useful public space for the local community. The arrows, the blue arrow shows you what the original crossing distance was, and the orange arrow shows you what the new crossing distance now now is. And as a result of that, as here's a street level view, these are some of my photos as opposed to Google Street View, you can see the community has come out and put planters and the council has put bike parking and in the picture at the lower part of the screen, these boxes here are utility boxes, normally grey and boring, they've become local artwork. We were able to get an artist to come and some small funding and a screen about local history. So suddenly you've created a space for a sense of community and belonging, as well as the ever critical drop curbs for people to be able to cross the road. Now we couldn't quite get as far as getting platforms or anything like this, but you have to take your wins where you can. So here's another view of this corridor. And as you can see, it is a runway corridor and it gets big delivery trucks in. And these big delivery trucks, we tried to negotiate completely out of the space and then to trolley back in, but this wasn't acceptable. But we got an extended curb build out beyond that so that people, you bring people to the line of parking so that they can see up and down the street. And again, space for bike parking and drop curbs to enable people to cross. Here you see a little side street as a result of these changes. This is normally where this lady in blue is. This is normally rammed with people parking illegally. You put in some bike parking and a planter, you've narrowed the entryway, you've made it safer for people to cross and you've made it nicer and more accessible for everybody. And most of these actual sort of hard build interventions are on a road safety budget that we're realizing these outcomes. And I'm gonna finish on this example from my local street because this illustrates perfectly, this is a traffic island to land on for pedestrians to cross the road. There's no drop curbs, there's steps and everything in here. This is a traffic intervention to manage traffic in and out of the roundabout at the top end of this high street. So this is one situation where I would support an island in the middle of the road because traffic is moving in lots of different directions and quite quickly. But we again argued with them that this is insufficient. And if you're going to make a proper investment in the public space, Let's go with this. They extended the island, they put in the drop curbs that you can see here, a passage through for people, and again, space for this grocery shop here to come out and actually put planters and utilize that. And again, there was improvements to the roundabout. And all of these measures were done on a road safety budget, but made such a significant difference to people on the high street in terms of creating space. When COVID hit, all of this was narrowed again, all the parking was taken away and we could adopt even more space for people to walk and enjoy being on their, their local high street. And so as a result of doing this, we then 
my, my reason for sharing this really small example is how on these little particular issues, you can make a difference. And then what we had to do was negotiate backwards up into Gloucester County Council and say, whenever you do road safety invent interventions and you have this investment that you are bringing into a neighborhood, let's make sure you understand the needs of the local community and how you can actually build in this expectation that you provide these other facilities as well. Because we're talking about a lot of them, Latin American cities, I wanted to share a, a, a story um, from Medellin in Colombia. And this is where we've done um, a project with children living in a poor part of town, neglected by the local authority, um, where we took them out with our app to identify, as you can see by all the red dots here, identify where their concerns were for their journey to school. As a result of this, they identified through these lollipops, they had an app but for the children, they used the lollipops. They identified three very different styles of interventions, which again, address all of the concerns that we were talking about. Safer points at which they interact with traffic by building better road crossings, avoiding heavy traffic routes by building pathways through parks, which all road safety interventions don't have to be on road, but can actually enable people to access their local services by moving them off road and improving the quality of the facilities that are available for people by widening these local um, sidewalks. And this was a critical thing for these children to travel safely to school. And you can see by the change in the red to the green here in these graphs, the change in perception, the user perception, not only of safety, but of comfort and enjoyment in working in that space. We've taken this app now into Dublin where we've, the Transport Infrastructure Department in Ireland have identified that women are choosing to walk less and it's safety and security um, that puts them off. And we're working with them at the moment in further developing this app so that we can embed these principles of gender and equity and access in the interventions that they make. And one of the reasons that I think these things have been overlooked and particularly on places like my local high street, I mentioned about Gloucester's priorities uh, being on through traffic is because historically we have valued long distance trips over short distance trips. And yet when you see these triangles, you see that the percentage of journeys taken of the majority of them are short trips. They are our local journeys. They aren't less important because they're shorter or their children going to school or their women accessing public transport. But the way that we've distributed our expertise, our money, our policy and our data has focused on the bigger dimensions of the transport system. So I wanted to just head towards the end here with thinking about these triangles and what that impact has had. We see it in all our cities, in the quality of the environments that we build. And here's one that will be very familiar for many people, which is the road user hierarchy about who we should prioritize in our public space. And of course it is pedestrians first, but it, as you can see in this drawing, it's not just about movement, it's about sitting and the quality of that space with trees and signage and park benches and the opportunity for community in that. And if we really want to deliver this for our cities, it has to be about um, creating safe spaces that address all of these other dimensions as well. And we've heard about mental health already. And as the world recovers from COVID, the working from home model is not going away as quickly as we might think. Businesses have discovered that they can have a lot of savings by people pe keeping people in their homes instead of commuting into city centres. And we will need these local neighbourhoods to support people um, who are working from home. And so we need to invest in local high streets like My Bath Road and not just in our downtowns for walkability. To finish on a couple of highlights, you'll know about the Nordic examples. Oslo investment in Vision Zero has led to higher investments in walkability and traffic management to deliver no pedestrian fatalities. The Seoul Metropolitan Government, their pedestrian improvements started, not the big famous um, Krongdong uh, road removal, but they realized that road safety was their problem and they started doing a whole range of interventions to improve pedestrian quality in that city. And now they do pedestrian quality interventions such as the Suelo 7070, which is where they took a traffic off a freeway and built a park. And Claudia has mentioned it already, the government of Ireland, their 20% of uh, their transport budget, active travel, that's a million euros a day for walking and cycling equally split. 
Us walkers are celebrating because cycling so often gets all of the money, but a million euros a day for walking. I mean, imagine the opportunities there. And so Ireland is a fantastic example where we need that leadership at a national level. We need them to set the budgets and the priorities. It translates down to local authorities like the one that manages my Bath Road. And we have to be fostering those national governments to change these dimensions because the Sustainable Development Goals needs their commitment. Our planet needs their commitment. We need to go beyond building our societies around our transport decisions and embed our transport decisions in our social systems and our urban fabrics so that they support our local communities. I'm going to finish with a lovely picture from Dublin because we are lucky enough to be in Ireland next year for our conference and we're hosted by the national government and we'll be talking so much about what national governments can do and how we can advance this agenda. I have to roll out the red carpet and invite you all to come. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thanks Bronwyn and you took us to the very difficult things of getting uh, a change in the whole way we go about planning the road system but also how simple it is to make improvements and I think uh, your city of Gloucester could certainly borrow some paint from Carly you don't seem yeah. to use any crotting at all to, I mean, Eviato on the, uh, in the questions picked up on the, the design of markings, how they can make a big difference, but marking free crossings is a, is a new concept for me, maybe. And Ireland, well, they've got it, they're, they're going to spend that money well, I think, because it's, it's, last time I was in Dublin, you couldn't cross the road at signals because the signals were far too short and nobody obeyed them anyway. So um, there's a lot to be done, but it's simple stuff. So thank you. Exactly. Um, let's move Thanks. quickly on to uh, Paula uh, in Santiago and bring us up to date at what you're doing uh, there. In, and you are from the regional um, municipal government. So you have a lot of issues of coordinating with the local governments and the national level as well. That's right. Can you hear me all right? Yes, loud and clear. Muchas gracias. Okay, thank you. All right, I'd like to thank you for the invitation. I'd like to thank the ITF from the regional metropolitan government. I'd like to thank all of you that are uh, connected to this session. I'm Paola Tapia. I'm going to tell you about a story as a former Minister of Transport and Telecommunications in Chile to share good practices and experiences that we developed between 2017 and 2018 in our country. I was also the first woman minister of transport. There had never been a woman head in the ministry before. So I think that also imposed an additional obligation on me to move forward with those mobility policies with agenda approach. Currently, I'm the head of the infrastructure and transport division at the regional government. And I'm also an academic and I'm proud to be the founder of Women in Movement. It's an international organization that in Germany, in Leipzig, uh, we started three years ago. The Metropolitan Regional Government in Chile is, it's the first time that has an elect government that was elected out of popular voting. I'm sorry that slides are, are in Spanish. We didn't have time to translate them. But so this is the first time that the regional government is elected. It used to be appointed by the president. And this is very important because of what St Stephen was mentioning. We have some differences between the local, the regional, and the national government. But now we have this elected official that uh, works on infrastructure, equipment, and transport. The mandate of this new regional government is to pass policies, plans, and projects, and to be like a link between the national agencies and the local agencies. We are in the middle, so we have a unique opportunity to generate this dialogue and these partnerships, and that's how we see it from the regional government. An initial question when we work on on these policies, we're going to build the first regional mobility policy. There's none so far. And when we decided to design that policy, we asked ourselves, why do we need this? And the question is heartbreaking. We need this policy because here in the capital city in Santiago, Chile, that's only 20 kilometers 
from us, a woman dies 16 years before, 16 years before, depending on where they live. That is because of their environmental conditions and their mobility issues. If those 16 years of life that are lost do not call us to action, and I'm sure these figures are similar or even worse in other countries, those 16 years of difference force us to try to have a fairer and more equitable city. If we add to this all the social riots throughout the world, because it was not only in Chile, we've seen this in Colombia, Ecuador, in the US, in France, we have to generate policies in a different way. The governments need to read and listen to voters in a different way. The foundations should do the same and academia as well. For what? For those 16 years of difference to disappear. So the studies show that the main problems are access to health care, lack of access to health care, environmental conditions, and the long hours that those women have to stay on public transport because of the distances they need to travel. And this is an example from a survey from 2020. An average, this is an average of travels that is 11 or almost 12 kilometers. And the travel time is over an hour and a half just one way, and then one hour and a half, the return trip, three hours per day. That's how much time a person can use on average per day to go to work. And uh, in the first panel, you shared some data. In Chile, 65% of our women travel for care reasons and 62.8% of men travel for work. We know that men go from work to home and from home to work if they behave properly. But women move in a network of short trips for care purposes. That is an essential difference. And of course, they make a higher use of public transport. So we need to generate mobility for them. Another issue that was not mentioned today has to do not only with women as users, as passengers, but also as drivers, but as drivers of public transport. In Chile, women that drive, that are drivers in public transport in 2007 were only 42 versus 18,000 men. You can see that in the graph. The red is the women you cannot you can hardly see them. So we generated a program to incorporate more women into uh, the driver's program. And we measured that in 2018, just to measure, just to show you two other characteristics. Women have a lower rate of accidents when they are driving the bus, they produce fewer accidents, and women have a higher score in the treatment to passengers. The passengers feel more welcome when, uh, when the driver is a woman. This is interesting. And it's important then to try and increase the number of women working in public transport. Why to lead? We've mentioned road safety, but we also have personal safety this, uh, or security. 57% of women avoid using the public transport at night. But in the city of Santiago, in a survey from 2018, the Latin American Development Bank. It was also held in Ecuador, Buenos Aires, and Santiago, Chile. Santiago obtained the worst ranking because nine out of 10 women had suffered some kind of harassment on public transport, nine out of 10 women. And additionally, Santiago, the capital city, is uh, highly polluted. 12% of women of deaths, sorry, out of pollution happen in Chile every year. These are alarming figures um, and force us to change the mode of transport and that inverted pyramid of the UN. So what we're doing is celebrating this first regional mobility policy. And we have built this three axes to make it inclusive and integrated, to include women, children, the elderly, to make it sustainable and healthy based on the data we've just seen, and also smart and participatory. 
making available all the modes and technologies, but also these are not pillars that we impose. These pillars came out of civil society because we've um, we've held a citizen participatory process that is not very common in my country. And this is what we did at the ministry. I wanted to tell you briefly about this. We started at the ministry in 2015. Then we started talking about the gender issue. But first, we did it internally. And this is key, I think. We could we could have asked foundations and businesses, do you have gender policies? Because how am I going to demand a gender policy if I don't have them myself, if I don't have flexi time or a gender unit from where vehicles are built? Because we brought the first electric buses in 2017. So the first thing we did was to change the structure of the vehicles because the seats were very high and they were made for the average, uh, the European average, not for the average Chilean. And that was a lack of gender perspective when it came to designing a vehicle. And we reduced the handles because they were too high and women couldn't reach them. So gender and gender approach internally to then lead this process externally. We ran communication campaigns, we designed human resource policies, always with the gender approach internally. And then we launched this program for women bus drivers. We created an award because it was a good incentive for the best uh, driver. We created strategic partnerships because many women told us we cannot study, we cannot be trained to drive a bus because we don't have anybody to care for our children because they're not paid a salary in the meantime. So we decided to have this policy for more women to be bus drivers. And we also established some contract obligations for the companies to hire these women that were being trained to be professional bus drivers. And so we designed the first gender equity policy in transport in Chile, and I think it was one of the first in Latin America. Very few uh, countries had this. Um, it's a um, roadmap that was passed in 2018. It's available in the webpage of the Ministry of Transport and Telecommunications. And we did it from the technical perspective. We created a permanent working group with public and private sectors. We created this award for the women on the road to um, reward those uh, institutions, universities, businesses that had a good uh, gender equity policy. And today at the regional government, along the same idea of citizen participation, with recreated this permanent working group with the civil society. We have over 60 uh, have registered. We've held two to four workshops. Um, we took office in June this year, June 14th. From this date today, this is what we've been doing, what I'm going to share right now. So the idea is that the measures are not imposed, but that they come from the citizens. This is um, the first week of mobility. I know this is done in other countries. And, and we said, our children are going to be our eyes. So we decided to launch this contest and children uh, were invited to draw the way they see the city. And these are some of the results we conducted a study, the results are coming right now about mobility and city to have an updated diagnosis and specific examples about the measures we can take. And this is connected to the previous presentation. We are working on urban interventions, particularly in integrated areas. This is an example of an area that is reached by the buses, the metro, taxis, and all the other modes of transport. And you can see here how people cross the street by putting, I mean, putting their lives at risk, of course. And so here we are working right now by coordinating over 20 modes of public transport that have some competition and they had never sat down together at a table to discuss how to improve a specific area. This is a pilot test. Then we're going to implement it in other places. It has a citizen participation, it has interventions, and it 
of course, it also has safety measures, not only road safety, but also security measures, because we are working with the law enforcement in order to reduce thefts and criminality in this environment. And we are designing this um, bike lane master plan, one of the most ambitious uh, 400 kilometer uh, plan, 400 kilometer. That's what our city has right now. But our intention is to reach 1,500 kilometers. And next year, we're going to um, implement 200 kilometers. So this is a long term project and we are implementing these new bike lanes in these sectors we are resuming very important projects if you know santiago we know you have we have this river the mapocho that goes through the city and in this project the city will be closer to the river coexisting with the river by walking and cycling so that's all by me thank you so much for the invitation Thank you very much, Paula. So you've set the bar very high now for Mexico City to uh, accelerate even further their expansion of their network of cycleways, which is good. I want to see who's going to win this competition long term. So um, without delaying any more, Hannah Silva, um, if you can take us to Fortaleza and where you really do know how to use uh, paint. Hello, everyone. I'll share my screen just a minute. So I'm very happy to be here presenting to you our experience in Fortaleza linking policies directly directed towards children and road safety, especially with the pass to school program here in the city that we, we are developing since, since 2019. So uh, let me begin. Around the world, as mentioned before in the first panel, uh, traffic accidents are the leading cause of death among children aged 5 to 14 years old. So in Brazilian cities, many children travel to school on foot and by bicycle. And to give, a, to give you a little bit of context, Fortaleza is a city in the Northeast uh, region of Brazil with 2.6 million people. So it's the third largest city in Brazil. And road crashes are now uh, the 16 cause of death in the city. And the position was much higher in the ranking uh, before 2014, which was the year that the transformation began here in the city uh, related to uh, many actions related to uh, sustainable urban mobility and road safety. So we are in the process until now of transforming our urban mobility and our city in a city more for people. So that being said, in Fortaleza, 55% of students from municipal schools make, make the journey on foot, so they walk to school. Um, and here we have a picture of what that journey might look like uh, with sidewalks that are not accessible and kids walking in the roadbed. But we understand that this, these active, active displacements should be encouraged, but it's very important for us to ensure the safety of children while, while doing that. And uh, talking about sustainability, we think it's very important to, uh, to speak a little bit of how can tactical urbanism help in this process. Uh, talking about tactical urbanism, we we'll think about mainly the those three pillars of tactical urbanism, which is, which is low cost. We implement a project using mainly uh, low cost materials like paint, planters, uh, picnic tables, beachers, it has a fast implementation, so in about three days to a week, we, we, are, we are able to implement a project, but uh, it has the ability to make a high impact in a community. So these, type, this, these types of implementations are part important because they serve as a project experimentation by the population before it's permanently built. So we have the, the, this type of implementation as a tool saying that maybe they can be temporary if people just let themselves and ourselves in our as a city implement uh, a, new, a new design for a street, which, is, which, is, which might be a little more uh, shocking sometimes for people with all these colors and uh, taking space from, car, from cars to people, but we are saying that we can experiment and if they don't like, maybe you can go back. We never 
went back before because people always uh, like the implementations and they ask them to be permanent. So talking about uh, the path to, to school program. So the program is the program starts uh, as I mentioned before, most of, the, of our kids uh, go walking to school. So we had a concern of how to make their path safer. And uh, we started by that by taking a map for the location of the schools. They are here in blue and they are uh, organized by number of students. And in red, we have the, uh, the location of uh, traffic accidents involving kids. So overlapping those two, uh, the, those two layers, we have a critical areas to intervene. It's cool areas, it's cool areas that we should intervene with road safety elements to make their school paths to choose for children to school, to the homes, a little more safer. And those uh, critical areas are mainly, mainly in low income uh, areas of the city in the out, outskirts. So uh, starting by that, we started to develop a few activities uh, with, uh, with the school community. So we have site visits, technical meetings, engaging with parents, uh, with school principals, and also with professors, but also with students. And uh, we will, I will be presenting a little bit uh, of the results of those workshops. Uh, so starting with the parents, we asked them to draw uh, in a map how they went to school, which way they, which streets they took, and how they, we asked them a little bit, uh, uh, some questions of how they go to have a more specific uh, characterization of uh, each school area. So in, in the streets, for, in the school area, for, for example, we had 67% of the parents that take the kids walking to school. Most of them don't have a car, but half of them have a, have a bicycle. And then uh, we started to, sorry, let me come back. We started to make engagement activity with, with kids. So we made different activities for each age group. So from four to five years old, we asked them to draw, just as it was a simple activity. Like we asked them to draw what they like to, to play on the street. So we have uh, an idea for when, when we will want to implement a solution for the area we might incorporate a few of the things they, they draw. So here we have an example of a, of a child, a, a little girl who draw, for example, a bike lane. And, oh, sorry. Uh, in the next day, sorry. Oh. Yeah, in the next age group from 10 to 12 years old, we, we did an activity for them to act as digital influencers of urban mobility. We uh, asked them to present to us. Uh, we gave uh, pictures of the school area around the school and asked them to present to us uh, what they like in the, in the area, what they didn't like the, uh, when they went walking to the school. So they presented to us and, uh, and Mark in the pictures that we gave them. So here's a, a little bit of an example of the, the, this activity in the hashtag it says, it can be better in Portuguese. Another one and the hashtag here, they wrote uh, the population needs help and they marked the lighting. They think it should be improved and the little soccer field that they think they should be improved. So with the older uh, students, we take a walk with the school, a walk around the school with them with the little frames read for, uh, for things that they didn't like and green for things they'd like. And we ask them to take pictures for us, uh, pointing out which one they were. So here in the sidewalk that is completely uh, the needs got completely re reconstruction. They took a, a photo with a red, red frame, for instance. So Cristo Hadanto was the first neighborhood that, that received uh, intervention to this path to school program. So here we have a few pictures of that. Uh, here was the before situation. We had about uh, three schools and then a community center and a health facility in the, in the, in the area. Here we had a lot of asphalt. We didn't have a, a play space near the, anywhere. So we built this plaza uh, mainly with uh, low cost elements in tactical urbanism like paint, uh, picnic tables, 
and uh, play elements for kids to play with. And with that, we were able to serve more than 3,000 students. And here's a picture of them walking from school to their homes, which is uh, mainly is the, all of them need to pass the plaza to walk to, to, to home, from school to home. And with that, we were able to reclaim more than 1,000 square meters for pedestrian space. Here is Mark some more pictures of the intervention. Uh, we were able to treat uh, six new crossings with our intervention. So here we have a sidewalk, which is a little bit uh, crosswalk, which is a little colorful, like Steve mentioned before. And we were able to implement 13 new crosswalks in just in the area. So the Paths to School program was, was implemented in three other neighborhoods in the city just until now. And with elements, sorry, with diverse elements like uh, urban furniture that we call some educational stations that we implemented in sidewalks, in, in sidewalks and in squares, making uh, si new sidewalks with paints so kids can have a little more space to, to walk in the, to the school and also to get them a little bit further away from cars. Uh, as we know that it's better for the air, our, both our quality and uh, road safety. And um, the project was a success and it, it was mainly because of partnership with best, best practitioners around the world. So we have all of those projects where uh, we implemented with partnership for health cities and actually GDCI with the help of global philanthropies and vital strategies. So uh, one of the most re rewarding uh, uh, indicators that we have is since the, we started the, the, to, to develop projects related to sustainable and urban mobilities that we were able to reduce by 53% the traffic uh, fatalities, the rate of traffic fatalities getting for Feliza. And this policy is not only on road safety, I'm, um, I'm speaking mainly about the project Pass to School, but it is a it's a policy that is focused on child development. So all of those policies, the one of road safety, like Pass to School, the other ones like implementing reading station in, in plazas, a home care pro program, bike sharing for kids, uh, of urban microparks, all of them are, are, uh, are since 2020 implemented in the municipal law and they have specific targets that we want, we should uh, achieve by the end of the municipal, uh, uh, like, how can I say the municipal, uh, the end of the mayor uh, policy. So it's a policy that builds uh, uh, that builds cities for children that make the city a space to play, and includes children in all projects, as I mentioned before, and allows them to leave the city with the caregivers. And it's a question that we we'll, we ask a lot uh, by having all these uh, elements and the, uh, by having the a street that is safer for them to play. What what will be this child's re relationship with the city? It will be much different from a uh, one that for a child that don't, don't have that. So we say that the greatest measure of success is the, of this policy is to see people experiencing and occupying the city in, the, in this case of Alisa. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Hannah. That's great to see how you're turning the city around from the bottom up. Um, we've got a very specific question for Paula, and then I'd like to come back to uh, questions of technical urbanism in Gloucester and in Fortaleza in Barcelona from the questions that have come up. So Paula, the question to you is, do you have any indicators of success from increasing the number of uh, women drivers? Is it, can you say already, maybe it's too soon, what kind of impact uh, the women drivers have in terms of reducing crashes, reducing incidents and improving the public transport system? Well, first of all, I should say that the amount of women drivers in Chile since 2007, we used to have 47 at the time. It has been multiplied tenfold, pretty much. We're about at about 500 women drivers in public transportation. The study that I mentioned was done in 2018 
it is available at the IDB's website and you can find it there and you can check this study. It's a quantitative and qualitative study and analysis. And that's why I mentioned some of the elements that women particularly value, for example, having a place where their kids can wait and be while they're driving or the payment that they get. And particularly in terms of criminality or transit criminality, we also see there the percentages and the citizen perception in terms of road safety. That's why I recommend you to read the study. Thank you. Um, so coming on to the um, interventions on, on, on the crossings in particular, Hannah, you said that there was a major issue of uh, people having to share the roadway uh, where the we saw in your picture some raised pave, some raised sidewalks, which were really not not usable. Uh, and in several of your pictures after treatment, we saw people walking in the road to get to school. How do you get uh, cars and people to share the space safely? And I guess one of the keys is the colorful diamonds and triangles you have in the middle of the roadway. But you didn't explain how that works. So if you could say a little bit more. Yes, uh, so we use tactical urbanism in this project as a way of uh, to start people, uh, to show people what could be done. But uh, the main uh, purpose of the project is to have a, uh, a permanent intervention built there. So uh, the diamonds uh, kind of represent a shared street in the future that is going to be implemented is already in construction in that neighborhood. But of course, uh, for a shared street to be implemented, it's uh, important to have a uh, safety uh, some other road safety measures to uh, to make traffic a little bit, bit more slow on that area. So we implemented the new speed limit for 30 kilometers of hour, an hour. We uh, we also have done some uh, some raised crossings uh, for the permanent project and some diverters and uh, some oh how can how can I say some. Uh, I forgot the word. <laughs> uh, some physical elements to uh, to uh, slope the speeds of the cars that go to that approach the school zone. So all these elements are important, along with, uh, of course, uh, the markings that are really uh, clear that that is a school zone, that that is a special zone that people should be aware that they are around children. Thank you. Yeah, Natalia, you might want to come in on what you've done as well in uh, in cities in Colombia. But Bronwyn, it seems like Fortaleza has more powers than you do in uh, Gloucester. Uh, I, we saw an interesting exchange in the question and answer. Um, but maybe you could say a little bit more about how you make uh, crossings safer, how you how you can achieve a street that's more orientated to the pedestrians through the primary user instead of the through car traffic which has taken over the space yeah it's a really good challenge i look with envy at the color in Fortaleza and lots of other places where they have adopted this tactical urbanism um, and it won't surprise you to learn that i've tried um, locally to uh, bring some of these ideas or even a cyclovia on a sunday or something like this and they now have a cyclovia but it's in a park so it's not actually achieving those results um, so the crossings is a really interesting one. Without markings on the road, they're not formal crossings. So pedestrians still have to make their own choice about when they enter the, the carriageway and cross the street. So it is making it safer, um, but it's not giving them priority. And that is a really critical switch in terms of recognizing that this street has a place function for people to move back and forth. Um, and putting in some markings. But I mentioned in the chat, there's lots of different ways you can do crossings. There is a controlled crossing there if you need it. And we've got a great campaign going on in the UK at the moment to change the Department for Transport rules about how you sign and mark a pedestrian crossing to actually grow some more flexibility so that we can put them into locations where we can communicate priority, but don't need to have a 10 meter lead space on, on zigzags and billy beliches occupying uh, pavement space. So having a mixture of these ideas, a palette if you like, 
Um, and I think we have to move towards this idea of prioritizing the pedestrian movement, but when we're a long way from that. Um, we need, and that's where those layers of governments come in again, Stephen, you know, we need that national, national direction and those national ways of liberating some of these opportunities for local authorities to do something uh, differently. What we do have locally is a pedestrian crossing on a roundabout, like at the curve of the roundabout um, because there was nowhere else to put it. So these things can be done when they, when they, when they see the need. Um, but I, I continue to campaign for colour and I, 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 won't, uh, I won't be stopping anytime soon. And Natalia, you wanted to come in? Yes, um, I just wanted to, to mention that we try not to talk about uh, um, tactical urbanism because I think this is thought as a uh, quick way of getting things done. But sometimes in our countries, especially or in our country, it takes a long time to get infrastructure in the area. So um, we initially started working with uh, interventions that lasted three months. And then we realized the government, and especially with the pandemic, they're not coming in to change that or to, to, to make it um, or to do the permanent infrastructure interventions. Um, so we, we are trying to do both, kind of trying to, to involve the community in the intervention, but also making sure there's infrastructure. So for the bicycle uh, path, what we did is uh, the murals uh, or the paintings on the road, but that's segregated with infra like permanent infrastructure. So it will be there for a few years and it will be protecting uh, the cyclists. Thank you very much. And on this question, Paolo, do you want to have the final word um, in your approach to improving the way pedestrians can get across roads which are dominated by cars and how you're turning that around in Santiago. Well, I just wanted to say that I added the link in the chat for the study. Many people asked about it, so I've put it in the chat. When it comes to cohabitation in the streets of Santiago, we are trying to intervene with a comprehensive vision. Tactical urbanism, yes. Feminist urbanism, yes. Street light traffic control and everything that is related for elderly people. Even we have created a bracelet that elderly people use and wear so that they can have more time to cross the streets. Yes, so technological uses in general terms, yes. Also, we do believe education is essential. So we need to make a considerable investment, not only when it comes to roads and schools, but also when it comes to have communication com campaigns with national, regional, local impact through which we can change the way we live in the public space. To wrap up, while I was a minister, we managed to have a record low in Chile and that is that after 29 years, in spite of the fact that the number of cars and people have grown, after 29 years, we recorded the lowest amount of fatalities due to traffic incidents. So this shows that if you get all these elements together, we, you can see the results. Of course, these results are available for you to see. And I think that this is a proof of something that we generally forget. And as I was, I used to, had a political role, I know that we're, and I'm convinced that this works. The problem is that we need to tell these things to people outside of this webinar, this protected space, and communication is essential when it comes to that. Okay, thank you. And uh, we're running out of time, so I'd like to stop now by thanking all of you speakers, Fernanda, Natalia, Claudia, Bronwyn, Paula, and Hannah, uh, you're all really making a huge difference in turning, array, uh, turning around the way that we look at sharing the streets and turning them back for the primary use of uh, pedestrians uh, against what has become a car-dominated uh, development pattern. So thank you all. Um, there were people in the uh, Q&A and the chat saying that you, I think all of you should have got awards for what you've been talking about, but I'm sure many of you will. So. Um, Thank you on behalf of everybody uh, that's been in the webinar. And I'd like to hand over the floor for final words on where we go from here with the Safer City Streets Initiative and the follow-up that we have in the pipeline. 
to Alex. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I've got a few pieces of news to share indeed. Um, first, I'd like to say uh, goodbye to members of the Safer City Streets Network because I'm leaving the ITF next month. Uh, this has been a, a privilege um, to engage with so many professionals and to make so many friends uh, along the way. It was inspiring, it was productive, helpful, I hope, also. Together, we created a global network from scratch. Here is the map of it. Uh, next year, I'm joining the Association of European Metropolitan Transport Authorities. Uh, as you see, I will continue working with cities and I hope to meet many of you again very soon. Uh, one such opportunity could be, uh, if I can just move one slide forward. Yes, one such opportunity could be the ITF Summit, of course. Um, so the 2022 edition uh, will be in Leipzig. Uh, please save the date, 18 to 20th of May. Um, it will focus on shaping inclusive societies. So I hope today's webinar gave you a flavor of what to expect. So what's next for safer city streets? Um, we are preparing a booklet for urban road safety measures uh, that will serve as a practical reminder uh, of the wide range of actions that cities can take. So expect this uh, published next month. The ITF also prepares a global gathering hosted uh, by the state of Jalisco in Guadalajara, Mexico. Uh, this is scheduled in April 2022. We will, of course, communicate with you all uh, when the date, when the exact date is set. Uh, this is certainly something to look forward to, and uh, I will leave you on this very positive prospect. Um, I'd like to thank again our terrific panel and thank you all for joining us today bye bye and thank you alex uh, so much and also great thanks to dominic strober who's been uh, organizing us and setting up this webinar and thank you once again to all of our speakers on behalf of everybody in the webinar thank you and see you soon <laughs>